Welcome, everyone. Thanks for, for turning out today. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have with us Kanchan Chandra, who uh, will talk to us about uh, the elections in India this year uh, with the title of Can a Hindu Homeland Be a Democracy? I'm reading from the screen back there. Uh, before introducing her, I'd like to thank um, the co-sponsors here. Uh, the, the event was uh, funded and sponsored by the Department of Asian Societies, Cultures, and, and Languages, and uh, the, the, Dickey, uh, uh, the Dickey Endowment, the Bodhis Family Endowment for South Asia Programming, uh, the Government Department, and the Political Economy Project. And they've also helped in getting the news out, uh, which is uh, responsible for this nice uh, turnout today. So I appreciate all the efforts of these various uh, programs. Um, and I also want to thank uh, all the administrators of these various programs. The one, uh, ones I've worked with uh, directly are uh, Hope, Hope Renee, and I also want to thank Navya Bharadwaj, who's uh, done a lot of work on this. I should mention also that after the session is over, uh, if you're still here, uh, we'll be adjourning across the, uh, the hall uh, where there will be some samosas uh, for, for those who hang around and uh, people will have a chance to talk to uh, Kanchan, but we have uh, precedents given to students. Uh, several students particularly wanted to, to talk with her. Uh, it's a great pleasure to mention, uh, to welcome uh, Kanchan here. Uh, Kanchan was uh, as you probably know, a student here, a uh, class of, of 1993, a senior fellow uh, who wrote a brilliant free senior fellowship on the Bharatiya Janta Party uh, in his, what turns out to have been his early years at that time, uh, when, uh, when not that much work had been done on the BJP. Uh, she is a professor of politics at New York University uh, has taught both at the New York University campus and uh, in Abu Dhabi. She obtained her uh, PhD in government from Harvard University in 2004 and her bachelor's degree from, uh, from, from here. She is the, the author of several books, uh, Why Ethnic Parties Succeed, Patronage and Ethnic Headcounts in, in India from Cambridge University Press in 2004. Uh, Constructivist Theories of Ethnic Politics from Oxford University Press in 2012, and Dynastic Dynasties um, from Cambridge University Press in 2016, as well as a host of, of articles and a host of more popular articles for the popular press, including uh, the Times of India, Economic and Political Weekly, the Washington Post, and Hindustan Times, um, and others. Uh, she, her work has been supported by a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship, a Carnegie, uh, a Carnegie Corporation Fellowship, uh, fellowships from the Princeton Program on Democracy and, and Development, the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, uh, an SSRC, uh, MacArthur Foundation uh, grant, um, the National Science, Science Foundation. I only mention a few uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, I won't go on uh, for any longer, but welcome uh, Kanchan Chandra for the talk today. Can you hear me? Is this working? The mic? Yes, yes oh, great. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and I should say it is such a privilege. Uh, it's a privilege, first of all, because I see two of my teachers in the audience, Nelson Casper and, of course, uh, Doug Haynes. Doug didn't mention this, but he has been sort of a very important intellectual figure for me throughout here and later, and the same with, uh, with Nelson. Uh, and I should say, I because of their... Their advising and their example, I really discovered what research was. And then, of course, uh, a community, and I think with Dartmouth, or the government department, but with Dartmouth broadly, it's a community that always stays with you. 
Uh, and then the several departments that sponsored this talk, but in particular, what is now the Dickey Center. When I was here, it was the Dickey Endowment. The Dickey Endowment was a great source of support. It was one of several uh, foundations at Dartmouth that supported my work with research grants. And I think um, while I was here, I received not just an incredible education, but I really discovered my calling. So it's a real honor uh, to be back. Um, I'm going to speak on the Indian elections. Uh, and as you know, they are, uh, oh, if you know, uh, uh, maybe you don't know, they will last, they're happening in seven phases from the 19th of April. So really in just about, just over a week up to the 1st of June. Uh, and there are, uh, you know, close, almost a billion voters, about 960 million voters, several hundred parties competing um, for 543 seats in the lower house of the national parliament. Um, of these parties, the front runner, and here there's a clear front runner, there's no, so no doubt about it, is the BJP, the ruling BJP or the Bharatiya Janata Party, led by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The BJP is fighting these elections as part of an alliance of about 30 plus uh, parties called the National Democratic Alliance or the NDA. Um, and the, but the BJP is the dominant partner in the alliance. It's contesting about, I think about 80% of the seats. The main opponent, uh, the BJP's main opponent is another alliance of about 20 plus uh, opposition parties. And I say 20 plus because the alliances are still really being worked out. The largest party in this alliance is the Indian National Congress, which was once India's ruling party and is now severely diminished. Um, uh, and this, uh, this alliance is called India, which is a clever name for a, for a full form that says Indian National Developmental Inclusive. It's a long guy, I just call it uh, India. And then, there are, and then there are several smaller parties, uh, regional parties really, that are going it alone. Uh, and there is, you know, you would all have heard, I assume, there is a consensus prediction about this election, which is a landslide win for the BJP. You know? um, the question in all of these predictions, and you have polls, you know, you have at least two very large polls done in India, you have a number of sophologists, you have predictions from outside. In all of these polls this time, the question really is not whether the BJP will win, uh, but what the size of the win will be. And like any prediction, of course, it's made with probability, not with certainty. It can be belied, and very strong predictions have been belied before, particularly with Indian elections. So, so there's no certainty here, but there is a high probability. There is also a standard explanation for this prediction, and I'm guessing you've seen this. It's in newspapers every day. And this explanation really rests on uh, what we see reported as the enormous personal popularity of Prime Minister Modi, and by extension, the BJP. So in cross-national polls, um, you see that he has the highest approval ratings of any, of any world leader. Uh, in India-specific polls, uh, these polls confirm the personal popularity of Modi too. These samples are much larger. Instead of a couple of thousand there are 30 or 40,000, and there's one poll that just came out last month, which is over 100,000. The sample sizes are larger. The findings are much more nuanced. The questions are more nuanced. And the figures, the percentages, are actually lower. But these polls also show that a majority approve of the performance of Narendra Modi to some degree. And when voters are asked to compare him with previous prime ministers, Indira Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, he usually comes out ahead. So from this, and I'm still sort of focusing on what I think the common perception is, it is routine to extrapolate that Modi's personal popularity implies a majority of seats and a majority of votes for the BJP. I want to start my talk with a different reading of the BJP support. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the BJP is weaker, significantly weaker, than you might assume from a quick reading of this news and the sort of summary that I, I just gave you. And then from that point, I want to answer the questions that I think most people have about these elections, which are, what does this mean for India's democracy? Is it backsliding and is it going to backslide further with such an outcome? Um, and then is, you know, does a BJP win mean um, that India will become a Hindu homeland? You see this asked over and over. And what does this mean for the rights of India's non-Hindu minorities? 
So the first point, why do I say that the BJP is much weaker than you might uh, imagine? Um, and, you know, I'm not, um, I'm going to take the polls at face value. So I don't, I, you know, let's assume the polls are correct. Um, I'm not going to question, I'm not going to, you know, look at the questionnaires or the sample size. Let's say that it is true that Modi is enormously popular personally, 70 to 80 percent approval ratings, and that the majority of seats predicted for the BJP are also correct. You know, the, the predictions are between sort of, you know, between somewhere between 300 and 400 seats in a 543-member parliament. Let's, let's accept that at face value. But here's the nub. The approval of a majority of voters for Modi's performance does not translate into the support of a majority of voters for the BJP. These are two distinct things. India does not have presidential elections, but parliamentary ones. Uh, there are regional issues, regional concerns, uh, and also, you know, also you could approve, you could approve sort of Modi as an individual, but not necessarily approve of the BJP as a political party. And in the end, you're voting for your local representative and not directly for the, for the prime minister. Uh, and so we cannot extrapolate votes for the BJP from support for prime minister Modi. Secondly, a majority of seats in the Indian context does not translate into a majority of votes. So India has a first-past-the-post electoral system. And in this system, a majority of seats can be won with actually a very tiny percentage of the vote, depending on how many parties are in the fray. Um, and in fact, this is what has consistently happened in India. You have had multiple parties win a majority of seats in the Indian parliament, sometimes with a landslide. So the Indian National Congress immediately after independence, the first three elections after independence, the Indian National Congress won about three quarters of the seats in parliament, 75%, almost every time. The largest majority of seats that any party has won in India was in 1984, when Rajiv Gandhi, after Indira Gandhi's assassination, the 1984 parliamentary elections, the Indian National Congress, led by Rajiv Gandhi, won 80% of the seats. You know, so over 400, well over 400. But no political party in India ever, and this includes the Congress, has ever won a majority of the vote. Um, not in 1951, not in 1957, not in 1962, and not in 1984. In these elections, the Congress vote really fluctuated between 45 to 49%. And in other cases, you know, you have the Janta Party in 1977, Congress Party at other times. When those parties have won the majority of the of seats, their vote share has typically been above 40%. So now we have the BJP. The BJP won a single party majority in 2014. That was a win that belied predictions. Most predictions at the time were that the BJP would be part of a coalition government, but it won a majority. It won a majority of seats again, a larger majority, 303 seats in 2019. And now it is projected, predicted, and it seems like a consensus prediction to win more seats. We don't know what the precise number is. But the majority of the seats that the BJP has won in the last two elections has never been based on a majority of votes. In 2014, uh, it received 31% of the vote. In 2019, it did better but it, that was 37% of the vote. And the polls these days, you know, actually it's very hard to get a precise prediction for vote share from the polls that have come out now, but the predictions that have emerged are about 40% of the vote, okay? which is not a big jump from the last election. Uh, so if we think about this, the majority of, the, sorry, the vote share that the BJP seat share is based on is thinner than ever before. This is a party that is, that has, and is projected to win a large majority, but the foundation of votes that underlies that majority is actually thinner, weaker than the, major, than the, the vote base that has supported parties uh, that have won majorities in India before. Uh, and so really, you know, one way, I think the, the common perception, especially with the approval ratings when you look at the BJP, the picture is of this expanding juggernaut. But what I want to suggest is the picture here is a picture of the thinning out of popular legitimacy, not its expansion, compared to other parties in India in the past. Now, what's also interesting about this is that the BJP is a major currently, in how it frames itself, a majoritarian party. Its platform has changed over the years, 
But at this point, 2014, 2019, 2024, there is no, this is not an epithet. The BJP sort of is very much a Hindu majoritarian party. But if we look at the vote share, the Hindus in India are about 80% of the population. So a party that wins 37% or even 40% of the vote does not have a majority a sort of majority of support among Hindus. So essentially what you have here is a majoritarian party without majority support. And I think that's something that actually sort of it's a, it's a more difficult fact for the BJP to reckon with than it might be for a party that did not frame its appeal in majoritarian terms. So one way to understand the extent of support for the BJP and the implications of that support for India's democracy is to ask not who is voting for it, but who is not. Um, and here, you know, here there's a, there, there, there are certain imbalances in the support for the BJP. It is quite broad-based, but we know, for instance, that the majority of upper castes vote for the BJP, but only a plurality of subaltern castes. Support comes for the BJP from both urban and rural areas, but more, a greater percentage of people in urban areas vote for the BJP than in rural areas. Uh, we know support for the BJP comes from all age groups, but a greater proportion of young voters vote for the BJP than older voters. But in general, and here I'm qu quoting the political scientist Suhash Shapachikar, uh, what you see is a consolidation of the more privileged behind the BJP and a dispersal of the less privileged. There are plenty of less privileged citizens who vote for the BJP, but there is a dispersal of the less privileged vote and a consolidation of the vote of the privileged. But what I want to show you is particularly the regional component of the BJP's vote and where the areas of weakness are. Uh, and this, let's see, I think... There we go. This is a map. It's produced uh, it's a, from an article by Gilles Lavenier, produced by data collected by the Trivedi Center for the Study of Indian Politics. These are the map shows you the 543 constituencies that are going to the polls in India. Uh, and this shows you the BJP support in these constituencies in the last elections in 2019. The really dark areas, the, sort of the maroon, is where the BJP won more than 60% of the vote in the last elections in the constituency. The, 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 the red is where it won at least 50%. So, you know, so the dark, the maroon, and the red are, are constituencies where it won majority support, more than 50%. And then everywhere else, the lighter it is, the weaker the support. And what you see here is a, is a clear regional pattern. The BJP has very deep support, particularly, let's see, this should work, in this area here, in, in, a, in a belt that goes from the west to the center, to the north. Uh, and then it has, it has ex you know, here you see sort of, you know, the south, central, east, and then the, the extreme south. And in general, what you see is strength in this particular diagonal that goes from west to north, and then a real weakness in the south uh, and east. Um, also, if you look at the composition of the BJP support, it really rests more, you know, the, the majority of the BJP's vote comes from five or six states, precisely in the belt that I, that I pointed to. You know? um, and so um, what this suggests is that the vote for the BJP is highly concentrated. And so if you think, if you think about sort of the edifice of you know, a large majority of seats, which I think is quite likely, that if you think of that as an edifice, it's a large edifice standing on a narrower foundation. Um, and so here, there's a second thing that I think is quite interesting, apart if we, if we move away from vote share for a moment, and we think about patterns of protest in India and globally. So globally, we know, and there's now a lot of literature on this, that the last 10 or 15 years have been an age of protest. You see a level of protest across countries, and particularly in democracies, that is new. And this is true in India as well. So at the same time that the BJP has been consolidating support, 2014 onwards, you see major instances of protests that are unpredictable. And there are three that I want to point to. One is the protests around the Citizenship Amendment Act that happened in around 2020. Then you have farmers' protests that happened twice, once in 2020 and one, once more recently. And the third is a, is a yatra term, I'll just translate it as maybe as a, as a tour or a journey across the yatra that Rahul Gandhi of the Indian National Congress so it started last year and is actually kind of continuing now. And what you see there, sort of the, the effort there was to go from the south to the, to the north. And there, I think, you know, popular support 
Uh, it varied from place to place, but what that yatra did particularly is galvanize uh, members of the Congress. It sort of really re rejuvenated the, the political party opposition. Um, and then there are other smaller scale protests that have been happening throughout these years. And so, you know, if you look at these protests, I think one thing they, one possibility they raise is what is the degree of stability of the support for the BJP, or it could be any other ruling party. You know, if you have this phenomenon where all of a sudden you see large numbers of people coming out on the streets, and then at least with the Citizenship Amendment Act protest, they disappeared also. You know, it was sort of this, this moment, this outburst, and then people, and then sort of the, the protest uh, faded away, and there, there are many reasons for that. But what that suggests, again, sort of the, two, the first point I made is the support for the BJP is weaker and more lopsided than you might think. And I think if we look at the protests, I mean, think about, again, political science theories on tipping points and this idea of people come out on the streets when they see a credible opposition, you know, in this case, the, the Congress party leading a yatra, or when there is a focal point, other people are out on the streets, you suddenly see this snowballing as, as many more people join. And then that sort of, that, that wanes. But I think that says something, you know, it says something globally also about the basis of, you know, what is happening in electoral systems. But I think if we focus on India, it says something, it suggests something about maybe a fragility or an instability in the support, not just for the BJP, you could think other parties as well. But there's something about this foundation that seems to be fragile as well as narrow. And I don't want to underestimate the support. I do want to highlight the BJP is stronger. It's sort of, it's going stronger, you know, with every election. So it is strong. It's just not as strong as I think a quick look at the headlines suggest. So now, what does this mean for the opposition? And what does this mean for the, for the likely outcome of these elections? And again, I'm no sophologist, but I'm working off the polls and surveys that have been published. Um, the opposition may not interfere with the majority of seats for parliament. Um, but probably what, is, what it can do uh, is produce pockets, air pockets, and the foundation of support for the BJP. Essentially, India is a federal system. You know, support is, is really it's varying across regions. And what you can see the opposition doing is really burrowing into the areas of weakness in this foundation, really exploiting those areas of regional weakness and weakness in social categories. And in particular, you see the opposition making a big bid for the support of subaltern groups, subaltern castes, but also subaltern groups whose support is more dispersed. Um, now, there is no one more aware of these areas of weakness than the BJP. And I would say then, then Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, the BJP and particularly Modi uh, are very, um, uh, uh, very strongly focused, very efficient, very well organized when it comes to the process of winning elections. And what you see here, and actually, you know, the, the opposition, for instance, took a much longer time to get its act together, to get its alliances sorted out, you know, all of the the candidates, I mean, the elections are starting in 10 days. All of the candidates have still not been published. The BJP got its candidate list out earlier. The alliance has got sorted out. Modi has been campaigning for months, you know, at least since January, if not before, although the official campaign period started more recently. And where is the focus of the BJP's campaign? It is particularly in the South and East, and it is particularly in these areas of weakness. So today, for instance, just today, I was checking the news on my way over. I mean, the time difference, but, you know, in... On the 10th, Modi sort of addressed at least two or three rallies in the state of Tamil Nadu in the south. Uh, precisely, where is oh. it is working? Okay, here we go. Precisely, precisely here. Oh, sorry, Tamil Nadu here in the south, right there. Um, so Modi has been campaigning tirelessly, and really the BJP also, and bringing every sort of aspect of competitive democracy to bear on these, on these areas of weakness, as you would expect in a democracy where political parties do in fact fight uh, to win office. The BJP has also been very successful in negotiating alliances in these areas, and much of the support, the areas of weakness are areas which the BJP is approaching through alliances with regional parties that have a stronger base. But at the same time, there is a two-pronged strategy. What you also have is the government utilizing uh, non-electoral means, authoritarian measures. And this includes control of the media, the curtailment of dissent, the use of the, and the use of the judiciary and of investigative agencies against opponents. Uh, and you saw that happen earlier last year with Rahul Gandhi of the Congress. Uh, and you see that more recently 
with uh, Arvind Kejriwal of the Aam Aadmi Party. This is a party that is strong, particularly in the states of Delhi, but also the state of Punjab, where the BJP has historically been quite weak. Uh, and here, I think it's worth comparing the authoritarianism, uh, which is sort of a, a creeping authoritarianism of, of Modi's rule, with the other major authoritarian period in India's democracy, and that is the emergency. The emergency under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi lasted from 1975 to 1977, and then Indira Gandhi called elections. These elections, there was an official end to the emergency, and these elections were fair, and she, in fact, was defeated. Uh, what you see in the 2024 elections is there are, in fact, aspects. It's no longer a level playing field. Um, uh, and here, in, two, in, in 2014 and 2019, the elections were, for the most part, a level playing field. And the success of the BJP was proof of its competitive advantage. Uh, democracy was, and not just under the BJP before as well, it was being hollowed out from within. But the shell, in terms of competitive elections, remained robust. In these elections, you see the shell also beginning to crumble. And here, I think I want to relate this authoritarianism with what I suggested about the weakness of the BJP. Um, there is, again, a lot. You know, here, there's already a story about the BJP circulating, which you would have come across. And there are predictions about authoritarianism you know, with the BJP that are linked to its ideology. And some are linked to the personality or the leadership style of Prime Minister Modi. But I also want to suggest there is an incentive for authoritarianism, which is linked to the pattern of support to these areas of fragility. Um, so now, let's say the BJP wins a majority of seats uh, at, you know, and also let's say it wins a majority of the vote at any given time. Right? There's also this question of how long would it be able to maintain that majority? The BJP does not have, you know, with the big majorities in the Indian electorate were won in the aftermath of independence where the Congress really enjoyed, you could say, the honeymoon of the long period of anti-colonial struggle. The BJP does not have uh, the benefit of that legacy. It has a strong organization, a clearly articulated ideology, but that is not strong enough to win elections on its own. And it has, you know, it has focused sort of, you know, the personal popularity of Modi, the economic performance associated with Modi, the strategic use of violence, which has often raised BJP's votes, the BJP's votes. Um, but these are not uh, sufficient to maintain a stable majority over a long period of time. And so that means, and here, this part, I'm sort of, it's, it's, it's speculative, but I hope that it is educated speculation that's, that thinks about what, what, what does a post-election uh, India look like? And I think the incentives for authoritarianism uh, uh, you know, the, the possibility of authoritarianism, of, const of, of constitutional changes uh, are, are higher. And here, I don't think, you know, if you think about what is happening with authoritarian regimes, I don't see the, I, I don't have an expectation of any naked use of authoritarian power. It is actually sort of authoritarian regimes also have been changing over the years. We read a lot about the transformation of democracy, but we should focus equally on the transformation of authoritarianism the increased use of elections, for instance, in authoritarian regimes to both gather information and deepen legitimacy, uh, the introduction of limited, limited aspects of competition, uh, a greater focus on welfare, on redistribution. And I think all of these, I think if there, is, if there are changes towards authoritarianism, I think this is the direction we're looking at. So possibly simultaneous elections, possibly a shift to presidential rather than, rather than a parliamentary form of government, possibly a shift, in, a change in party registration rules, possibly a reform of India's federal structure that actually has a great impact on the weakness of support for any political party in, a, in a, such a regionalized system. It's hard for any political party to win a national majority. Um, and so I think what I sort of, what I imagine here is the possibility of a, a reshuffling, a reorganization of competition not of the cessation of the competitive principle. So that's the first point. Uh, the, the, the point. The basic point I wanted to make just about the, the, uh, the, the BJP is stronger than it has ever been before, but weaker than you might expect. Let me go to the second point. Doug, how much longer should I talk? <laughs> I can stop here if you want. No, no continue. I'll say, okay, I'm going to do an abbreviated version of two, 20 more minutes. Okay, I'll try and do it because I want to have enough time for questions. What does this mean for Hindu majoritarianism in India? What does this mean for the idea of uh, India as a Hindu homeland? 
And you would have heard, you would have read this question in the press, will India become a Hindu homeland after the elections? I get asked this question all the time. And I think the question is misleading because it places, it places this question of majoritarianism in the future. Uh, but what I would say is if by a Hindu homeland, we mean a country in which Hindus have a greater claim to government by virtue of their larger numbers, then India is already a Hindu homeland. This process had already begun at least since the 1980s, if not before, under the Congress party. And it has been particularly accelerated by the BJP government, and I would say particularly after 2019. So another way to put it is this. The political battle for control of the Indian government at the national level and the regional level continues. But the ethical battle for a pluralist India is over. Um, it has already been won by the majoritarian idea. The debate in India now, the ethical debate, is really between different shades of majoritarianism, not between pluralism and majoritarianism. And this is an important battle. All shades of majoritarianism are not the same. But it really is a battle. It's a second order battle over the kind of Hindu homeland that India is becoming, not a first order battle about whether it is becoming one. Um, and let me, you know, there's, I, I don't want to, there's a lot to say here, but let me just illustrate this with reference to the consecration of the Ram Temple in the northern city of Ayodhya, which happened in January 2023. Um, so some of you may know, some of you may not, that what stood here for centuries was a, at this site was a 16th century mosque. In the 1980s, the BJP and its affiliates argued that the mosque stood precisely on the birthplace of the Hindu deity Ram and called for the destruction of the mosque and its replacement with a temple as an assertion of the rights of Hindus in a Hindu majority nation. The mosque was demolished in 1992 by activists associated with the BJP and its affiliates, the RSS and the VHP. In 2019, almost three decades later, India's Supreme Court declared that demolition illegal, but at the same time enabled the construction of a temple there. The temple is still unfinished. You know, this you sort of see it from a particularly from a, uh, from a, a flattering camera angle. The, the, the temple is still, the, the construction is still ongoing. But in, 20, in January, Prime Minister Modi presided over its consecration. Just if we look at the temple, I'm going to talk about some data in a moment, but the simple existence of the temple, by virtue of its existence uh, and its history, underlines the second place uh, position of Muslims, the largest non-Hindu minority in India at present. It is a show of power, not a site of religiosity. And I say this because um, if we think about religiosity, you know, there's sort of many, many forms of religiosity and many deities. There's Ram, there's Shiv, there's Vishnu, there's Devi, there's Durga. Uh, and for those, has anyone here been to Ayodhya? Um, Ayodhya, Ayodhya has thousands of temples. Most of them are, are temples to Ram. But there are also there are a number of Shiv temples, for instance. They are really beautiful temples. You know, Ayodhya is like a, it's like a tableau. It's like a... It's like a large theater set. You have, you have the whole story of Ram illustrated at every site. This is where Ram was born. This is where, this is where his father, King Dashrath, ruled. This is where the palanquin of his wife, Sita, this is where she got down from the palanquin. This is her kitchen. This is where she cooked. This is Ram's throne. This is where his brother sat with Ram's slippers on the throne. There is a temple for everyone and sometimes multiple temples. They are beautiful, small-scale temples. Many of them are in a great state of disrepair. If this were a matter of religiosity, you would think there's so many temples in Ayodhya to go to already. If this were a matter of religiosity, perhaps the solution would be restoration. But this is not about religiosity or not primarily about religiosity. It is about power. Uh, and it is also a show of power. The temple, you know, so what's interesting, again, for this, I, these were the days when I was at Dartmouth when the campaign for the destruction of the mosque and the replacement of the temple was at its height. And the slogan then was, it was sort of all of the, the, the BJP, the RSS, and the VHP affiliates, the slogan was, Mandir Vahi Banayenge, which in English is, the temple has to be built precisely there, right there. And that, so the idea that you destroy a mosque and then replace it with a temple is a physical demonstration of the power of Hindus in a Hindu-majority country and the second place a position of Muslims 
in that country. And you know, India is the third largest Muslim country in the world. We're talking about, about roughly about 180 million people. Now, this is not, this is not just, it's not just a symbolic uh, demonstration, but also if we look at the history of political representation of Muslims in India, and this started long before the BJP, the BJP doesn't particularly, so doesn't, you know, doesn't pro offer representation to Muslims for the most part. In the candidate list released so far, I think there's one Muslim candidate, about 400 plus. Uh, um, but what you see in the Indian parliament is a decline in candidates, in sort of tickets offered to Muslim candidates across political parties. You see a decline in political representation. In Muslims form about 13% of the Indian population, just about 5% of parliament in the last elections. Um, and what you have here is, you know, many people say this, what you have, you know, very few Muslim political parties. So for the most part, what you have is who, who is able to then advocate for Muslims in the Indian political arena? It is typically multi-ethnic or larger political parties, Congress, the opposition, regional political parties. And for now, most parties are not saying very much. You know? So what you see here is the robbing of agency. You know, essentially, Muslims are not being represented in sufficient numbers to speak on their own behalf. And other parties are not necessarily speaking for them either. And when other parties speak for them, what is the content? Nobody is talking about education, employment, representation, rights. At a minimum, you know, there's sort of a minimum support. People, parties are promising to protect the status quo. We'll protect India's pluralism. We'll protect fundamental rights. We will protect security. And also, I haven't even spoken about violence. You see, you see in sort of, you know, uh, Muslims suffer disproportionately in in uh, acts of violence that are called riots, but are more often, more accurately described as pogroms. This happened before, you know, sort of 1983 under Indira Gandhi, you had the Nelly massacre in Assam. So, you know, disproportionately you had Muslims killed. This hasn't started with the BJP's regime, but it is certainly, so that's what I mean. You've had a creeping majoritarianism for a long time, but it is already, what you see in India now already is a second place for, for Muslims, particularly. All minorities are not equal, but I would say Muslims, that, is, that has already happened. So then, what does this mean? If we're thinking about a world of, of different shades of majoritarianism, all majoritarianisms are not equal, I want to say a little bit about uh, Prime Minister Modi's majoritarianism, which I think is quite, uh, is quite distinct. So the BJP, the RSS, and the VHP together, you know, they're all guided, including Prime Minister Modi. This is the ideology he was trained in. It was the RSS's ideology of Hindu nationalism. This is primarily an ideology of cultural nationalism. And it focuses primarily on the transformation of character, on the training particularly of Hindu men. The idea is the transformation of society by first training and transforming 1% of society, training essentially what are called pracharaks, or you know, volunteers, um, uh, transforming their character and through them transforming everybody else's character. The focus has always been on social transformation. The RSS doesn't really have an ideology of the state. Uh, and it doesn't have an ideology of the economy. These things, now that you have a BJP government in power, you know, for two terms and, and quite likely a third, now these are things that the RSS is beginning to think about. But for the most part, its ideology has been an ideology of cultural nationalism. The program for the demolition of the mosque and its replacement with the temple was replaced by a BJP leader where the focus was entirely on cultural nationalism. Modi's vision is not only, certainly the cultural, national, national the, na the cultural nationalism component is there, it's a strong component, and there has been a, a lot of legislation passed in two th from 2019 onwards that focuses on that. But Modi also has a component in his vision of uh, a Hindu nation which emphasizes technology, economic modernization, uh, economic growth, and the future. Uh, and this, you know, here we've had other prime ministers who dream of modernization before, Nehru, particularly Nehru and Rajiv Gandhi, where modernization, in, in, the modernization of the Indian economy and the Indian polity was central to their vision. But for Modi, in the way that Modi defines it, modernization emphatically doesn't mean any form of westernization. And, you know, when we analyze what is happening under the BJP, they're clearly sort of there are clearly ways in which the ideology of Hindu nationalism approximates nationalist ideas that have developed in the West. 
But in the way this is framed, and let me give you one example, the temple really embodies that. You know, everybody focuses on the temple, and the photos you see are always of the temple. And there are some quotes, for instance, someone interviewed about the temple said, you know, a temple is all very well, but why isn't the government providing us with schools and hospitals? And here, with, with Modi's vision, the tr transformation of the temple is associated with schools and hospitals and roads and bridges and airports and railway stations. What you see here is not just the rebuilding of a temple, it's the rebuilding of the entire city. And if you go to Ayodhya now, what you would notice much more than the old temples, you'll see the new highways, you'll see a massive new airport, a huge railway station, a whole complex of hospitals. Uh, uh, and here what Modi, so you know the emphasis, so for Modi, the emphasis on cultural nationalism and economic modernization and technological modernization, these are fused. And you see this also in these infrastructural uh, projects. This, I think, is a shade of majoritarianism associated particularly with Modi. Um, uh, and in this shade of majoritarianism, you know, what is the, what is the place of India's minorities, in particular Muslims, in this picture? Uh, my sense is that you know, there are certain there are strands of RSS ideology, and this is true for Modi as well. The emphasis here is on uh, domination. Domination, but not necessarily assimilation and not, uh, not expulsion. You know? So the, the idea here is you have, sort of, you have legislation in place. You change the symbols of the state. You change the vocabulary of the state. You establish who has primacy in this homeland. And once you do that, you can, you know, of course, you can challenge patronage and development and modernization and maybe even political rights towards Muslims. So the BJP had no Muslim candidates in the last elections. This election, it has won. You see efforts now on the part of the BJP to recruit support among sections of Muslims. You, know? you see an emphasis on, say, the channeling of patronage. Right? There are other versions of Hindu majoritarianism where the place of non-Hindu minorities, the focus is on is on assimilation or on expulsion, for instance. So there are, you know, there are other variants of Hindu majoritarianism where the focus is also much more on religiosity, on revivalism, on a dream of the past rather than a dream of the future. You know? I won't, there's not enough time to go into all of these different variants, but one way to think about what, uh, you know, what the future of India as a Hindu homeland is and how much it is associated with Modi is to ask what would happen if Modi were not re-elected? Would India then stop being a Hindu homeland? And I think the answer is no. It just would be a different kind of Hindu homeland. Let me say, finally, I'll take two, three minutes and then stop, because I, the third point is actually very important. So if this, if this is the present and the immediate future, which I've described as a future that is, that is both more authoritarian and majoritarian to some degree, just with different shades of majoritarianism, um, to me, this is a pessimistic outcome. Uh, and it is pessimistic, not just for minorities, but for members of the majority too, for everyone. One reason this is pessimistic is just on ethical grounds, regardless of how you're actually affected. But if we think about how you're actually affected, majoritarianism is bad for minorities, but it's bad for majorities too. You know? Because every majority is in the end a collection of minorities. Uh, and when you have, you know, the interesting thing is right now the focus has been on exclusion and on economic modernization. But sooner or later, a majoritarian idea is going to focus not on who's outside, but who is inside. Sooner or later, the terms of exclusion are going to shift to the terms of incorporation. And when that, when that debate shifts to the term of incorporation, you have to think, well, who is the right kind of Hindu? Who's in and who's out? And here, I think, you know, there is a, there is a hope of sort of maybe a, a more benign form of majoritarianism, or maybe sort of potentially a, 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 a dissembling of the majoritarian idea. And I think that hope lies in caste. And I think it lies in particular with uh, Dalits. Dalits, you know, many of you will know, some of you will not. Dalits is the term, the term means broken to pieces. Uh, and it is a term that once denoted oppression that has been inverted as a term of assertion. It refers to those once treated as untouchable, historically treated as untouchable in the Indian population, who form at least 16% of the Indian population by some measures, you know, probably more. Um, so I say uh, Dalits, I say there is a hope that lies with caste, but in particular in Dalits, for two reasons. One reason is that there is no such thing as a Hindu majority without Dalits. Um, all majorities, as I said, are illusory. And so essentially, once you shift to majoritarianism, all you do is open up the Pandora's box of what a majority is. 
Uh, and as you do that, Dalits are crucial. Um, if you remove 16% of the, of, Dalits are mainly categorized as Hindu. So if you take away 16% from that 80%, you end up with a very highly diminished uh, majority. It's almost a fifth of the Indian population and almost a fourth of the Hindu majority. And that is why since the idea of majoritarian politics emerged in India in the 20th century, the idea of the majority and the idea of democracy really evolved at the same time. One depends on the other. Since the idea of a majority was introduced in the Indian subcontinent, all political figures have been very concerned about Dalits. You know, Gandhi, that was a major concern. Dr. Ambedkar, you know, was a major concern, a concern for Congress. And there were ethical concerns, of course, this idea that Dalits represent the most stigmatized section of the Indian population. But there were also instrumental concerns. How could anyone produce a majority without including Dalits? Um, that also remains the case now. But here, and this is the second reason why I think there's sort of hope that lies if we think about Dalits, is it's not, it's, this is not a story about numbers, but among Dalits, you have a well-developed tradition of egalitarian thinking. I'm thinking here not just of Dalit numbers, but Dalit political theory. And here there's sort of, again, many, many variants. There's no, there's no, one, there's no one answer. But as democracy pushes people towards majorities and minorities, many majorities can be pernicious. So, you know, whether a majority is benign or not depends on the ideological basis on which a majority is constructed. And so far, if you look at the ideological thinking among different variants of Dalit thinkers, uh, there is not, as far as I can see, a well-developed exclusivist trend. Dalit, the different variants of Dalit political thinking happen to seem to be mostly egalitarian. Uh, and here, this is my last slide, and then I'll stop. Um, here that you have, um, I've put three figures um, on the slide. The first is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar is a very, very prominent, uh, you could say, political theorist who also uh, was a Dalit and who uh, chaired the drafting committee of the Indian Constitution. Uh, next to him, you have Kanshi Ram. Kanshi Ram was much younger. He was born in 1934. Uh, he really, he built a political party in 1984 called the Bahujan Samaj Party. I did my, done my dissertation, my first book um, on the BSP. Uh, uh, Kanchi Ram died in uh, 2006, but he saw himself as a lineal descendant of Ambedkar and developed sort of, you know, developed sections of Ambedkar's thought into the ideology of the BSP. And here you have at the bottom, you have Mayawati, who has been the head of the BSP for the last two decades, who remains, I would say Mayawati is not associated so much with any new ideological thinking, but has been associated with the leadership of the BSP, particularly after Kanshi Ram's uh, death. Uh, and what you see here, you know, with, um, with Dr. Ambedkar, there, is, there are reams and reams, there are multiple volumes of writing where Ambedkar was constantly thinking about how India, and especially as democracy approached, how it could address the, the problem of caste, and in particular, the problem of untouchability. Initially, he thought about the reform of Hinduism, you know, so he read, so led movements to say, drink water, you know, drink water from the same tank as upper caste Hindus. Gandhi was doing something similar at the time, sort of a reform of Hinduism. Then at some point, um, uh, Ambedkar spoke, you know, he thought it's not just sort of, you know, piecemeal reform, temple entry, or drinking water from the same wells. He thought uh, Hinduism needed to go through a reformation in the same way that, that Christianity did. And so he argued that Dalits, the term Dalit was not in use then, but he argued that those who were, whom we would now call Dalits should be called Protestant Hindus, where he was really arguing for a sort of a transformation of the nature of Hinduism itself. Then later on, after that, at some point, he said in an essay on the annihilation of caste that, you know, that the sort of Hinduism is beyond reform, but the, the, the solution to the problem of caste and inequality lies not, you know, lies essentially in kind of an, in, in an eradication of Hinduism itself. Uh, he then started, he also thought, he said it's not, you know, the solution is not then atheism or agnosticism. He argued that you need some sort of spiritual sustenance. And so if you're going to give up on Hinduism, there has to be some other religious basis. He then, he, you know, he looked at, he sort of looked at some sort of synthetic religion. He looked at the egalitarian possibilities in Christianity, in Sikhism. It was a, you know, and in the end, in 1956, he converted to Buddhism, but he had a particular interpretation of Buddhism. And so what you see here is an experimentation, a real change in his ideas over time, but essentially a constant search for egalitarian possibilities. Um, 
What you saw in Kashi Ram, Kashi Ram really saw himself as a lineal descendant of Ambedkar, but Kashi Ram took a very strong position saying, I'm never going to talk about religion. It's too divisive. It's not going to win me any kind of political support. But he spoke about the inversion of political hierarchies. I know it's not inversion, uh, 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 sort of a horizontalization, if I can use that word, of, of hierarchies, political, economic, and social. And the way that he led, he had a you know, much simpler, he didn't write so much, he had, a much, he had sort of a much more focused program. And what, he, what he, he typically did in his ideological sort of camps is to say that Indian society looks like this, it represents sort of a, a hierarchy, you know, where you have sort of higher on the hierarchy, you have upper caste, you have sort of privilege, and the lower down you go, not just with caste, not just Dalits across, you know, essentially he used a, a very simple idea, the idea of a pen to represent hierarchy. And then he said what the BSP should do is turn that hierarchy on its head, make it horizontal. And when I first heard this, when BSP cadres first told me about this, I asked many, many times, can you show me exactly what he said? Did he say, we take this hierarchy and we invert it? We turn the tables, which is the idea of majority rule or domination. It's an idea of turning of the tables. So I said, did he invert it? They said, no, he, he sort of, he laid it on its head. And I think I just want to highlight, it's another way of thinking about the egalitarian possibilities uh, of democracy, you know? And I don't need, I don't mean to idealize or homogenize Dalit thinking. I also think, you know, minorities need not necessarily produce egalitarian ideologies. But in this case, you have sort of a long tradition of thinkers who have thought about the egalitarian possibilities within a majoritarian uh, framework. I don't think this is, I'm almost at the end, I don't think that this is, um, this is likely anytime soon. And the reason I show the picture of Mayawati is the BSP was once sort of the strongest voice for minority politics in India. That was in the 90s and a little bit about, you know, 15 years ago in 2012. Now what you have is a, is a party, the BSP, which is more or less decimated, you know, sort of it's it almost disappeared from the Indian political landscape. And so this kind of egalitarian possibility, I think is, so, you know, this, this kind of egalitarian hope, I think is very low, very low probability. But, uh, but the point about hope is uh, hope is about possibility, not about probability. And I think to the extent that there is hope, it lies here. I'll stop here. Yes, I would love to feel questions. Sorry, I talked so long. Any questions? I think there are. Doug, will you? Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Muhammad. Uh, uh, I was thinking. Do you have a microphone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's not loud. So I was thinking uh, with uh, the BGP, the prime minister has assumed the role of uh, being an ethnic uh, um, uh, entrepreneur, uh, mainly abusing the right of the Muslims and also the Christians, but Muslims are the main victim. Uh, and I was wondering what would be the implications of it, especially regionally and globally, in terms of regional, how the Pakistan state or the government is using or abusing or will abuse this opportunity if Modi wins election. And how would it set a global order, especially considering the relationship, the good relationship between U.S. and India? Thank you. Should I answer? Okay, no, very good question. Thank you. And I think the short answer is I do not see major foreign policy implications, you know, so for two reasons. Uh, well, I, there's one reason. I think, I think India's relationships with other political countries, including the U.S., are based on, on notions of real politic from both sides. And the question of, of minorities in India, uh, you know, people make noises, but they do, not, uh, they do not determine the relationship. And I, as one example, that's certainly true of the US. I mean, you know, Biden is not openly sort of raising questions about sort of minority rights in India. But I think to me, what's particularly interesting is, as far as I, don't know, I think the first country that Modi visited after the consecration of the temple was the UAE. Uh, and, you know, Modi is the first prime minister to visit the UAE in 30 years. Not the first prime minister overall, you know, but in 30 years. The relationship with the UAE is very strong. And to some extent, you know, what the, what the BJP government in India wants to do is to say, well, other countries have a state religion. Majorities are sort of, you know, dominant in other countries, whether they're democratic or not. And so just as the UAE is sort of a, you know, you could say a Muslim country with a state religion, 
India is a Hindu country, which should have a state. You know, it's sort of that, that sort of idea. So I don't see major foreign policy deterrence. Hey, uh, hello. Um, I want to ask something about like election logistics and like formation of alliances and bo on both uh, fronts, perhaps. So, uh, looking from the perspective of like comparative politics, um, I know that like uh, similar formation of alliances in Hungary and even Turkey. Also, I'm, I'm Turkish, um, so uh, similar uh, opposition no alliances were formed in Hungary. In Hungary, they lost like pretty big, like forty to sixty. And uh, many people back then said um, the opposition got 40% because um, basically the opposition um, alliance, they were just like really diverse in their ideas, you know, really left-wing ideas, uh, sometimes, um, you know, secular conservative, um, and they just couldn't get, get along, right? So that, that's what they, they said uh, for Hungary. And in, in Turkey, they kind of came close uh, to winning, but they, they still didn't win. And um, so I just want to ask, like, because... And in India, it seems to be um, the case with the India alliance as well, that, you know, uh, there are a lot of opinions um, on that front. And um, so, again, I, I, I'm Turkish, and um, uh, in, we, we also had a local election. We just had a local election in Turkey, and um, in that local election, we didn't have any alliances, but this time the opposition won. So um, I guess my question is... Um, would you say um, right now, like the polls are showing that um, the India alliance is doing pretty bad? Would you say, like, uh, if um, the biggest party in the India alliance, for example, right, um, they they entered the race like um, singular, would you say that that would perform better? So great question. No, I don't. I actually have my own mic. A great question. Um, I think when it comes to the opposition, it's sort of I think it's clear that that uh, that if there is you know that alliances will bring the opposition more votes than going it alone. Uh, but the challenge for the opposition is actually both first coordinating on the alliance. There are a number of alliance talks that have broken down, but also once there is an alliance, coordinating on strategy. That is difficult for the India alliance now. It has always been difficult. And what you see is parties that on the one hand, even though they're in the alliance, they're sort of doing their own thing. Um, but I think the alliances are also where, to the extent that there is some unpredictability in this election, the alliances is, is where the unpredictability lies. And I can't resist here sharing a quote with you. This is from uh, Prime Minister VP Singh, who was India's prime minister for a brief period from 1989 to, early, to 19, early 1991. Um, and he, you know, I was a graduate student then. He, he sort of he spoke at graduate school. I interviewed him later. And he was speaking about the relationship between identity and voting patterns in India. And I asked him, I said, well, if people vote so much on the basis of identity, as you suggest, then where are the politics? Why can't we just read off the vote from the identity category? And he said, the politics is in the alliances. Yeah. And so I think that's what we're looking at in this election. The politics is in the alliances. And that's where there remains some unpredictability because the BJP's alliances are more or less set. In the India alliances are still being negotiated. Good question. Hello. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I was going to ask, you wrote about patronage politics and ethnic politics in India nearly two decades ago. <laughs> now that work, I believe, 2004. Uh, and you talked about both party structure and you know how and when ethnic or patronage parties uh, succeed in India. But I'm wondering, since the BJP came to power in 2014, do you think that has meaningfully changed in India? Do you think that BJP being in power has restructured how patronage and ethnic politics work, or no? Uh, again, a great question, and I think we are actually seeing a restructuring of how patronage works. And again, this is, I think, particularly, there's sort of a lot of, I think, a personal role that Prime Minister Modi plays in this. What you had when I wrote the book, you know, really what you had for the most part is retail patronage. And you had everybody, you know, everyone, the MP, the chief minister, everyone wanted to control a piece of the patronage because that's, that was a big way in which you build support. So I remember sitting actually in, the, in, in Mayawati's waiting room. She was then sort of the chief minister of the state of Uttar Pradesh, you know, which has a population larger than the population of Russia. And the people that I was sharing space with in her waiting room were there for a hand pump for their village, for a job for their son. You know, it was very, it was retail patronage. Uh, Modi has digitized patronage sort of to a very large extent. And so now you have, for instance, gas connections, bank accounts. There's sort of the use of technology to centralize 
and, you know, to, in a way, turn it to wholesale patronage. So you're absolutely right. The structure of patronage is transforming, and I think that has fundamental consequences for the nature of representative politics. Hi, I'm John V. Um, so my question is, do you think there's a sort of a cognitive dissonance among other minorities in India where they understand what's happening to Muslims, but they're sort of accepting it? And Or do you think there's this sort of transformation that's happening where they understand that today it's like the Muslims in India who are the second like largest majority, but still a minority, but in the future it could be perhaps them? I think it's a great question, and I have two answers to this. You know, one is um, uh, in India in general, and also for the BJP, all minorities are not equal, you know? So for the BJP, Muslims are a particular problem, and have always been, so, you know, from the, from, you know, from the, from the time of the partition, at least, uh, and then Christians. The, the BJP and also Modi have a relatively benign approach towards Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jains. You know, uh, and so for instance, the, you know, the infrastructure projects Modi has announced, one of the first infrastructure, one of the first pilgrimage corridors uh, was sort of a corridor that, that, that highlighted Sikh relig religious shrines. You know, so that's the first thing, all minorities are not equal. And I don't see, even if we look at minorities, I don't see sort of links of empathy across minorities, actually, you know. The other thing is, so, and I also don't think, I don't think people look at this and say, oh, where next? You know, but I think the problem is it's not just a lack of empathy or a short sightedness. I think the problem lies in the nature of democracy itself. What does a political order look like that is not that is democratic, but not focused on majorities and minorities? You know, you have a long tradition in democratic theory that focuses on minority rights. But all of the work on minority rights really emphasizes sort of how minorities can get more than they might otherwise in a majoritarian system. They, very, they know very few majorities or the arguments about minority rights that say minorities should have the right to rule. And so in this, for instance, you know, I, I was listening to an interview last week by a Muslim political leader who said Muslims in India have only become vote givers. You know, so that's the difference, you know, so, so you can be vote givers, maybe you can be treated well, maybe you can be the recipients of patronage and economic development, but there is a difference between those who simply sort of give votes and those who are in a position to rule. And I think the deeper problem is we do not have an imagination of democracy or a theoretical position on democracy that actually that sort of gets away from the majority minority framework. Hi. Um, you specifically mentioned uh, when talking about the coalitions of the BJP as young people particularly supporting it. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on that and like, especially with students being so considered like leaders of West left wing movements and left wing politics, why they've been supporting a right wing party. Ah, oh, it's a great question. It's a great question. So I suppose I have um, maybe two, um, maybe two or three responses. The first is, the, you know, uh, um, uh, young people support the BJP disproportionately, but I have to look at the figures. I don't know that we can say, I don't think it's true that the majority of young people in India support the BJP. The BJP does not have a majority of the vote, right? It has 37% of the vote. So it can't be true that a majority of young people support the BJP. What we know is that more young people support the BJP than those higher on the age uh, ladder. You know, so it so BJP vote for the uh, young people support for the BJP is entirely compatible with young people support also for left wing revolutionary movements and other things. They're just they're just a lot of young people in India. You know, <laughs> so that's I think that's the first point. The second point: What about the young people who do support the BJP? Uh, I think a lot of that support is I, I think it's associated particularly with Modi's view of a modernized, forward looking. Uh, superpower. You know, I think there's a way in which, uh, I think that is a very attractive vision. Uh, and, you know, you may not, I mean, India is in the throes of an employment crisis, and right? there are very few jobs, and employment among the, the young and educated is higher than actually for so young and less educated, right? So at one level, you might think, you might look at this unemployment rate and say, why is this not producing actually higher opposition for Modi among young people. You know, the young and educated also disproportionately likely to support Modi. But I think the idea there may be, well, there's no party that is doing better on jobs. 
you know? And Modi at least presents a vision that is, uh, that is, that is an attractive uh, vision. I'm guessing that, you know. So it's a speculative answer to your very good question. Um, uh, hello. Um, I had a quick uh, question thinking about the map you showed at the beginning. Um, thinking about, like, uh, I guess, linguistic um, areas, um, is there any linkage to, like, uh, the BJP's lack of support in a lot of the South to its, like, strong promotion of Hindi to the, like, detriment of, like, maybe, like, other regional languages? And B, if that's true... Uh, why, why is there so much comparative support in uh, Karnataka yeah. uh, compared to the rest of like the majority Dravidian speaking areas of the South? Yeah, Thank that's you. great questions. And the second, you know, so 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 yes, I would say historically, I mean, the the BJP now does not take a strong position on Hindi as a as a link language or a national language, uh, but it used to be sort of one of the centerpieces of the B, of the of the party that preceded the BJP, called the Bharatiya Jansang, from which the BJP was, uh, you know, which, which the BJP kind of traces its origins to. So, so it, I would say historically, the BJP has not done well in the South. I think there are many reasons for that, including how hard it tried, including the BJP's own origins. But it's certainly true, I think, that its, its policy on Hindi certainly did not make it attractive uh, to the South, you know. Now you have sort of, you know, two voices. I mean, the Home Minister, Amit Shah, said about maybe four or five years ago, sort of took a stronger position on Hindi. Modi contradicted that position immediately. So these are different voices in the BJP as well. And Modi currently is giving, you know, uh, is giving election speeches in Tamil Nadu. And what's interesting is he speaks in Hindi and a, a local BJP leader then translates for him in Tamil, Nadu, in, in, in Tamil. And you can see the response of the crowd is not the same as when Modi is reaching out to people in Hindi and Gujarati, you know? So I, 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 I think I, Hindi, I think the question of language is an issue, but I would say one, one, of, one of many issues. And it may be, I think, the question of alliances and the, and, the, and the history of regional parties in these states, that may be a more important issue. Tamil Nadu has had a history of very strong regional parties. Similarly, Andhra Pradesh, where the, the BJP is weaker. Karnataka, the Congress has always been stronger. It has a weaker tradition of regional parties. Maybe that's the reason for the higher support in Karnataka. Again, speculation. I think we have time for a couple more, and then we have to, uh, we I think have to move the, out of the room. Yeah, I think that the back. Oh, sorry. Yes, please. Anyone? <laughs> Shall we collect, Doug? Should we collect two, three? Yes, let's. I was, I was thinking of that. Yes, let's have three questions, uh, and then uh, Sanchan can answer. Uh, the three. Um, hi. So you talk about how Hindu majoritarianism has been like in India for a while. My question is more on like authoritarianism and how. Um, BJP has contributed to the unraveling of uh, democratic freedoms. Like one could be with how the election commissioner was elected, UAPA and so on. Um, and you, you also position Dalits as a possible hope for the future. Um, wh what, would, uh, what could be a hope to restore these kind of freedoms? Like what could be um, the way that this comes back? Do you see the Supreme Court playing any role in this? Good question. Should we collect? Thanks so much. This is amazing, by the way. I, I'm curious about, uh, I noticed that Modi was uh, kind of conscripting the uh, memory of Jayalitha yes. when, she was in, when he was in Chennai. And um, you talked about the difference between assimilation and expunging of uh, an entire people. And I, I, I'd love you to speak to that a little bit. Does that feel more like, I mean, if I remember correctly, that was a lot of antipathy back in the day when she was alive. So what does that look like, the, the two versions of that? And does it depend on Dravidian versus Muslim? I'd like to hear a little Thank more you. about that. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the DBA community and how, like, in general, BJP is weaker than it seems. But, like, last year we had a caste census in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, which showed that they might actually be over, like, 50 to 60 percent of that population. It was supposed to significantly change the electoral outcomes, but it didn't. And with protests for CAA and RC, like, there is a large expression of dissent, 
but it doesn't show any difference in any policy because I feel like there's still some level of like economic incentives given. No political party in power will like take back reservation to an extent that it will take away their voter base. So I like, and in all these years of first past the post, we haven't seen like a clear bipartisan alliance, which is what I feel like would be needed to like overpower BJP right now. So I'm wondering how you see that alliance playing out and what would which, an alliance, alliance across, like any alliance against the BJP, like a combination of all opposition parties would look like because wouldn't that be necessary right now? Because we haven't seen that so far. Please, please. <laughs> okay, got it. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Let me take the first question on authoritarianism. You know, I think um, uh, we have to look at the authoritarian sort of trends under the BJP government, but we can't locate this authoritarianism only in the BJP government and only in 2014 or 2019, you know? So what you have, and I think the the the... Uh, the trend, the capacity for authoritarianism in India starts with the constitution. You have emergency powers that are a component of the constitution, and then also the legal structure right from independence onwards. So the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which actually is still in effect in seven states in India, started off as the Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance under the British, and it was simply sort of, it became law, and the first place I think the government used it in is Nagaland as law. You know, so what you see here is the equipment and the use of that equipment of authoritarianism over time, repeatedly. Uh, the emergency was a period where, you know, in fact, the emergency was constitutional. It was sort of invoked. But also the Rajiv Gandhi period particularly was actually a very important period if we think about the strengthening of the security state in terms of both legislation and manpower. You know, so what we have now, the, what, what the BJP has done is accelerated that trend and sort of made it more precise. So the BJP, the BJP did not introduce the UAPA legislation, but it modified it to, to allow it to target individuals and not just organizations, you know? So I think, again, when we think about authoritarianism, I think what we want to do is distinguish between shades of authoritarianism, what came earlier and what is coming now. But I think the authoritarianism has a longer history. And uh, so again, you know, the trend towards authoritarianism, I think, would not change if the BJP or Modi left power. I think it would just be a different mode of authoritarianism. And that is not, this is not to say it's the same. I think there are better and worse forms of authoritarianism. But I just want to highlight there is more of a continuity here. You know, it's sort of a difference of degree, a major difference, but not a difference in type. Um, I'll just say um, on alliances, I think, um, I think, um, I think alliances are important. I think there's a lot more scope for alliances, but I don't see alliances in the current landscape as overturning sort of the verdict in any major way. But I think what is very interesting about the alliances, including the areas you pointed to, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, but also the Congress alliances, there is a very strong push towards, uh, not just regionally, but focusing on the alliances uh, that have to do with subaltern groups. You know, this, the Congress's Bharat Joro Yatra, this tour, this nationwide tour, it's not just political theater, it is an attempt at outreach. Every place, it's sort of an attempt at outreach to party workers and to potential supporters. And what you see there is a very major effort through, through that outreach to create a subaltern coalition. I think that's the unpredictable part, but I think no matter sort of how strong that gets, I don't see that as overturning the verdict, overturning this prediction in any major way, you know? The final point on assimilation, actually, you know, that, um, so, um, so, you know, with assimilation, um, there is an old position in RSS ideology which says that, um, you know, that all those who live in India share the same cultural heritage. Those who are Muslim simply converted to Islam but are culturally Indian, you know, similarly for those who are Sikh or those who are Christian. But there's one way of saying that everybody is culturally Indian. We all share the same heritage regardless of religious faith. But there's a slight shift in how the RSS uh, expresses it, which is a very major importance. It doesn't say we're all culturally Indian. It says we're all cultural Hindus. 
And so the idea of assimilation is one way. The idea is we're all cultural Hindus, but what does assimilation mean? It means if you're Muslim or you're Christian, you should still respect and applaud this temple as a cultural symbol associated with our heritage. But it doesn't go in both the directions. Hindus are not asked to respect the Jama Masjid or the Golden Temple or the synagogue in Kerala as elements of their cultural heritage. You know, so it's a one-way uh, assimilation. And I think at this point, you know, I think Modi himself lets the temple speak for itself. I don't see sort of a major push right now in Modi's regime towards assimilation in that sense. But you do see changes already in the educational system. But I think there are other proponents, other components of the RSS BHP family that take, that take a much stronger position on assimilation. And I think one of the things right now, there's sort of been changes in education policy, but I think this is potentially one very major area of change uh, with a, in, in a post-election environment. We better adjourn here since we uh, have to leave the room by 5.30. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.